Upon signing out, I cast around for some place in the New England countryside or sleepy small town, Elms White Church, where I could spend a studious summer subsisting on a compact box full of notes I had accumulated and budding in some nearby lake. My work had begun to interest me again. I mean, my scholarly exertions, the other thing, um, the other thing, my active participation in my uncle's posthumous perfumes had by then been cut down to a minimum. One of his former employees, the CEO of a distinguished family, suggested I spend a few months in the residence of his impoverished cousins, a Mr. McCoo retired, and his wife, who wanted to let their upper story where a late aunt had delicately dwelt. He said they had two little daughters, one a baby, the other a girl of 12, and a beautiful garden, not far from a beautiful lake, and I said, it sounded perfectly perfect. I exchanged letters with these people, satisfying them. I was housebroken and spent a fantastic night on the train, imagining in all possible detail the enigmatic nymphette I would coach in French and fondle in Humbertish. Nobody met me at the toy station where I alighted with my new expensive bag, and nobody answered the telephone. Eventually, however, a distraught Macu in wet clothes turned up at the, at the only hotel of green and pink, Ramsdale, with the news that this house had just burned down. Possibly owing to the synchronous conflagration that had been raging all night in my veins. His family, he said, had fled to a farm he owned and had taken the car but a friend of his wife's, a grand person, Mrs. Hayes of uh, 342 Long Street, offered to accommodate me. A lady who lived opposite Mrs. Hayes's had lent Maku her limousine, limousine, a marvelously old-fashioned square-topped affair manned by a cheerful negro. Now, since the only reason for my coming at all had vanished, the aforesaid arrangement seemed preposterous. Preposterous. All right, his house would have to be completely rebuilt, so what? Uh, had he not insured it in, uh, sufficiently? I was angry, disappointed and bored, but being a polite European, could not refuse to be sent off to Long Street in chat in that funeral car feeling that otherwise Maku would devise an even more elaborate means of getting rid of me. I saw him scamper away, and my chauffeur shook his head with a soft chuckle. En route, en route, I swore to myself I would not dream of staying in Ramsdale under any circumstance, by, but would fly that very day to the Bermudas or the Bahamas or the Blazes. Possibilities of sweetness on Technicolor beaches had been trickling through my spine for some time before, and Macu's cousin had in fact sharply diverted that train of thought with his well-meaning but as it transpired now absolutely inane suggestion. Speaking of sharp turns, we almost ran over a meddlesome suburban dog one of those who lie in a wait for cars. As we swerved into Long Street, a little further, the Hayes house, a white frame horror appeared, looking dingy and old, more gray, than, more, more gray than white. The kind of place you know will have a rubber tube uh, fixable to the tube faucet in lieu of shower. I tipped the chauffeur and hoped he would immediately drive away so that I might double back unnoticed to my hotel and back. But the man merely crossed to the other side of the street where an old lady was calling to him from her porch. What could I do? I pressed the belt button. A colored maid let me in and left me standing on the mat while she rushed back to the kitchen where something was burning that ought not to burn. The front hall was graced with door chimes, a white-eyed wooden thingamaboop of commercial Mexican origin, and that banal darling of the arty middle class, Van Gogh's Arlesien. 
A door a yard to the right afforded a glimpse of a living room, with some more Mexican trash in a corner cabinet and a stripped sofa along the wall. There was a staircase at the end of the hallway, and as I stood mopping my brow, only now did I realize how hot it had been outdoors, and staring to stare at something, at an old grey tennis ball that lay on an oak chest, there came from the upper landing the contra contralto voice of Mrs. Hayes, who, leaning over the banisters, inquired mel melodiously, Is that Monsieur Humbert? A bit of a cigarette ash dropped from there in addition. Presently, the lady herself, sandals, maroon slacks, yellow silk blues, squarish face in that order, came down the steps, her index finger still tapping upon her cigarette. I think I had better describe her right away to get it over with. The poor lady was in her middle thirties. She had a shiny forehead, plucked eyebrows, and quite simple but not unattractive features of a type that may be defined as a weak solution of Marlene Dietrich. But in her bronze-brown bone, she led me into the parlor and we talked for a minute about the Maku fire and the privilege of living in Ramsdale. Her very wide set sea green eyes had a funny way of traveling all over you, carefully avoiding your own eyes. Her smile was but a quizzical yerk of one eyebrow, and uncoiling herself from the sofa as she talked, she kept making spasmodic dashes at three ashtrays and the near fender, where lay the brown core of an apple, whereupon she would sink back again, one leg folded under her. She was obviously one of those women whose polished words may reflect a book club or bridge club or any other deadly conventionality, but never her soul. Women who are completely devoid of humor, women utterly indifferent at heart to the dozen or so possible subjects of a parlor conversation, but very particular about the rules of such conversations, through the sunny cellophane of, a, of which not very appetizing frustrations can be readily distinguished. I was perfectly aware that if by any wild chance I became her lodger, she would methodically proceed to do in regard to me what talking what taking a lodger probably meant to her all along, and I would again be enmeshed in one of those tedious affairs I knew so well. But there was no question of my settling there. I could not be happy in that type of household with bedraggled magazines on every chair and a kind of horrible hybridization between the comedy of so-called functional modern furniture and the tragedy of decrepit rockers and rickety lamp tables with dead lamps. I was led upstairs and to the left into my room. I inspected it through the mist of my utter rejection of it, but I did discern about, above my bed uh, René Prinet's Kreutzer Sonata, and she called that servant maid's room a semi-studio. Let's get out of here once, I firmly said to myself, as I pretended to deliberate over the absurdly and ominously low price that my wistful hostess was asking for board and bed. Old world politeness, however, obliged me to go on with the ordeal. We crossed the landing to the right side of the house, where I and Low have our rooms, Low being presumably the maid and the lodger lover could hardly conceal a shadow when he, a very fastidious male, was granted a preview of the only bathroom, a tiny oblong between the landing and Lowe's room, with limp wet things overhanging the dubious tube, the question mark of a hair inside, and there were the expected coils of the rubber snake and its complement, a pinkish, cozy, coily covering the toilet lid. I see you are not too favorably impressed. Sorry. I see you are not too favorably impressed," said the lady, letting her hand rest for a moment upon my sleeve. She combined a cool forwardness 
the overflow of what I think is called poise, with a shyness and sadness that caused her detached way of selecting her words to seem as unnatural as the intonation of a professor of speech. This is not a near household, I confess, the doomed dear continued, but I assure you, she looked at my lips, you will be very comfortable, very comfortable indeed. Let me show you the garden. The last more brightly, with a kind of winsome toss in the voice. Reluctantly, reluctantly, I followed her downstairs again, then through the kitchen at the end of the hall, on the right side of the house, the side where also the dining room and the parlor were. Under my room on the left, there was nothing but a garage. But a garage. In the kitchen, the negro maid, a plump youngish woman, said, as she took her large glossy black purse from the knob of the door leading to the back porch, I'll go now, Mrs. Mrs. Hayes. Yes, Louise answered Mrs. Hayes with a sigh. I'll settle with you Friday. We passed on to a small pantry and entered the dining room, parallel to the parlor we had already admired. I noticed a white sock on the floor. With a dep deprecatory grunt, Mrs. Hayes tooped without stopping and threw it into a closet next to the pantry. We cursorily inspected a mahogany table with a fruit vase in the middle, containing nothing but the still glistening stone of one plum. I groped for the timetable I had in my pocket and surreptitiously fished it out to look as soon as possible for a train. I was still walking behind Mrs. Hayes through the dining room when beyond it there came a sudden burst of greenery. The piazza, sang out my leader, and then, without the least warning, a bluesy wave swelled under my heart, and from a mat in a pool of sun, half-naked, kneeling, turning about on her knees, there was my Riviera love peering at me over dark glasses. It was the same child, the same frail, honey-hued shoulders, the same silky, supple, bare back, the same chestnut head of her, a polka-dotted black kerchief tied around her chest hid from my aging ape eyes, but not from the gaze of young memory, the juvenile breasts I had fondled, fondled one immortal day, and, as if I were the fairy tale nurse of some little princess lost, kidnapped, discovered in my gypsy rags through which her nakedness smiled at the king and his horns, I recognized the tiny dark brown mole on her side. With awe and delight, the king crying for joy, the trumpets blaring, the nurse drunk, I saw again her lovely indrawn abdomen, where my southbound mouth had briefly paused and those puerile hips on which I had kissed the crenulated imprint left by the hand of her shorts, that last mad immortal day behind the rocious roses. The twenty-five years I had lived since then tapered to a palpitating point and vanished. I find it most difficult to express with adequate force that flash that shiver, that impact of passionate recognition, in the curse of the sunshot moment that my glance slithered over the kneeling child, her eyes blinking over those stern dark spectacles, the little hair doctor who was to cure me of all my aches while I passed by, while I passed by her in my adult disguise, a great big handsome hunk of movieland manhood, the vacuum of my soul managed to suck in every detail of her bright beauty, and this I checked against the features of my dead bride. A little later, course, a little later, of course, she, this nouvelle, this Lolita, my Lolita, was to eclipse completely her prototype. All I want to stress in that is 
All I want to stress is that my discovery of hair was a fatal consequence of that princedom by the sea in my tortured past. Everything between the two events was but a series of gropings and blunders and false rudiments of joy. Everything they shared made one of them. I have no illusions, however. My judges will regard all this as a piece of mummery on the part of a madman with a gross liking for the fruit verte. Au fond, ça me bien égal. All I know is that while the Hayes woman and I went down the steps into the breathless garden, my knees were like reflections of knees in rippling water, and my lips were like sand. And that was my low, she said, and these are my lilies. Yes, I said, yes, they are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful.